Welcome to a Theological Dust Up, hosted by Free Thinking Ministries. I'm Dr. Tim Stratton, and with me today is, in my opinion, one of the top epistemologists in the world. Now, although he's far too humble to agree with me, at least on that score, it's a pleasure to have Dr. John DePoe on the show today. How are you doing, John? I am great. Thank you for having me. And I, I certainly wouldn't put myself in the ranks of, of the tops in the world there, but um, I am a fan <laughs> of epistemology and metaphysics and uh, really enjoy opportunities to uh, think about, write about, and of course, teach uh, others about things that I think are really important in those fields. Yeah. Now I got to say, you're looking great today. I mean, I came here wearing this hoodie and you got a suit and tie on. I'm going to have to up my game. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> What maybe you know? I'm I'm able to influence our audience to have a higher opinion about uh, some of what I say if I if I look like I'm dressed for the position. But, uh, <laughs> well, you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I've learned so much uh, from you uh, reading your works um, over the past few years, uh, watching you interact and read papers, and just uh, some of the dialogue that we've had, even in the hallways at uh, philosophy conferences. And I uh, just want to thank you for the work you've done. I think um, you're, you're strengthening the faith of others. You've strengthened my faith and you've helped me to uh, just think deeper about epistemology and, and metaphysics and things like that. But yeah, I, let me talk about that. I introduced you as an epistemologist, but for those who have never heard that, that term before, that you know, it might sound kind of scary. Can you tell us exactly what epistemology is and what an epistemologist does? Yeah. You know, epistemology really is just that part of philosophy that looks at uh, really how we believe, what we believe, what are the standards for belief, how is belief related to knowledge? So one of the biggest questions we want to think about in epistemology is what does it mean to know something? Yeah. Um, or and there's a few other major concepts. I would I would put the biggest ones as knowledge, justification, and belief. Yeah. So. Um, I think that those are really important things to think about because uh, we want to understand things like when, what would it mean for me to say that I know that Christianity is true or mm -hmm. that I know that there is a God? Um, could we ever be in a position to look at somebody who has a different belief in us and say they don't know it, but they might be justified in believing mm -hmm. the thing that they believe in? And, and so these are different concepts and, and I think really important to think through um, and have some pretty important practical implications as well. Yeah. So uh, tell us, what is this justification that you're speaking yeah. of? You know, I think the, the simplest way to understand the concept of justification in epistemology is the idea of having good reasons to believe something. Yeah. So I'm justified in believing that my car is in the parking lot. I can't see it right now, but I have a good memory of where I just left it not that long ago. So I'm justified on the basis of my memories of where I left my car, we might say. Mm -hmm. um, so justification, just a matter of having uh, good reasons. What would, what would you call something that would then take away your justification yeah. for uh, uh, believing where your car is parked? Right. You know, we sometimes epistemologists and philosophers in general really like terminology um, sometimes terminology actually helps us and clarifies things, and sometimes it just can, muddies things. I think a really helpful term, though, here is one we usually call a defeater. Yeah. So a defeater is um, there. It can come in different forms. So there can be what we you call an undermining defeater. So an undermining defeater would be one that looks at uh, the reasons that I gave and wouldn't dispute. The, that I have those reasons or that those reasons would point to the truth of the thing, but then tries to kind of undermine uh, the, the credibility of them. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I might say, I remember very clearly um, leaving my car, you know, parking my car here, but it could be undermined yeah. maybe with uh, the observation perhaps that I just took some LSD though about five minutes before <laughs> I make these, these uh remarks or, or draw upon those experiences because we know that hallucinogenic drugs might influence your ability to recall correctly. Right. Yeah. Um, so that we might say that you have the memories, but the memories actually turn out to be useless or worthless. Mm -hmm. um, there's other kind, there's a rebutting sort of uh, defeater and a rebutting defeater might be one that considers other reasons to give up your belief. So maybe, um, 
for instance, I might say, uh, I remember parking my car here, but somebody comes and said, yeah, but five minutes ago, I just saw your wife driving off in it. Right. Oh, okay. You know, that would be more of a, of a rebutting sort of defeater, yeah. one that gives reasons to give up that belief um, in, that, that I thought I had good reasons for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, now that I've uh, been swimming with these or, or in these waters for a while now, it's 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 funny how I look at everything uh, uh, as, you know, do I have justification to believe this? And are there any, any defeaters, even with, you know, from not just talking about God and religion and metaphysics and things like that, but uh, even with uh, politics and who should I vote for? Yeah. And do I have a justification for this? Is there a defeater to this? And I'm like, I'm looking about or I'm looking for defeaters all over the place. <laughs> so it's kind of a blessing and a curse, but I think it's more of a blessing. It's really helped me to yeah. think uh, through these things in this way. I don't know. Does, does it, yeah. has it impacted you on your everyday life as oh, well? Man. I, I will say one of the most formative events in my life was taking my very first philosophy class as a freshman in, at, at college. And it was, uh, the class was called critical thinking. Yeah. And it was a class that basically teaches you to get your antenna up and to be thinking constantly. Do you, uh, you have good reasons for that? Is that fallacious? Are there, you know, what, you know, is that a really sound inference or not? Are there other, uh, considerations I'm not thinking about for this? Mm -hmm. And it transformed the way I looked at everything. Like yeah. you said, it's not just the big questions of like, you know, God and metaphysics, it would be even down to, you know, uh, pra very practical questions, you know, before I was married, you know, am I, you know, does she really like me? Um, or should I, you know, is it really worth my time to spend my money in these ways? Right? Uh, should, is this the better political candidate? Or is it that mm -hmm. candidate? Um, the, the, there are um, so many ways we're constantly having to make decisions. Should I invest my money like this? Or should I invest it in that? Um, so, uh, being a, a careful thinker is, is very, you know, something that will pay off dividends in life. But I think that we, so one of the things that I think about is philosophy. A lot of times people say, what's the, the benefit and the use of that? What's the point in learning logic and the point in, mm -hmm. in critical thinking and even doing these high levels of metaphysics? I'm never going to use my, my debate on the, on universals versus, uh, you know, nominalism yeah. ever in my life. And that may be true. Although, you know, I think that you might be surprised when these things actually do become relevant. Mm -hmm. But I would say that every day of my life, I'm using my mind to think carefully and critically. And I have sharpened my mind on the hardest debates, which philosophy puts before it. So the study of philosophy in a lot of ways is like, um, you know, it's like CrossFit for, for the mind. Oh, that, uh, you know, I love it. You know, when you go to the gym and you do all these absurd exercises, I mean, what are you training for, dude? Are you really think you're going to need to do that particular move right. or use those particular muscles in that way? Probably not in, in most of our lives. But the training is there to make your body fit for whatever task mm. is at hand. Yeah. And that is what I think is at least part of my story of in my experience, what philosophy has done, it has sharpened my mind uh, in a way that makes me prepared to think about any subject, not right. just the ones in philosophy. Mm -hmm. So a little plug there for, for philosophy in general, um, but, <laughs> but I think that, that that really is the value in it for sure. For well, philosophy is CrossFit for the mind. Yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, okay. So um, we've talked about justification and, uh, and, and belief a little bit. So let's talk about knowledge. Um, do you like the, uh, the, the three word definition of knowledge? What do you think about justified true belief? Yeah. You know, this is the classic view of knowledge. Many would say it goes back to Plato in his dialogue, Theotetus. Um, some Plato scholars kind of raise their hands and like, I don't think that's exactly what Plato's saying. There's a historical question, but clearly, you know, there, there is this tradition that knowledge is a matter of justified true belief. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think that knowledge is a kind of justified true belief. Yeah. Um, so what what would I say there? So one is that those are sort of a, a necessary condition for knowing something is one, you have to believe it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's hard to say that you have knowledge of something if you lack the belief, you know? Um, so that seems pretty a pretty obvious and a pretty minimal commitment there. Yeah. Um, second one is we think that it needs to be true. 
Um, and this is just this this idea that that we tend to think that knowledge is a very special case, and that it must be what some philosopher some philosophers call factive, mm. meaning um, that knowledge is a success term. It is something that points to the fact that it is true or the things it describes are real. And that it just, by definition, if you if it's not true or if it's unreal, then you can't know it. Yeah. Um, and then the controversy typically surrounds this third one, which is justification. Uh, there are some people that have a very strong intuition that you need to have absolute certainty to know something. Yeah. So if you just lack that kind of certainty, some people just think you don't know things. Uh -huh. I'm not in that camp. Um, I think that that's just way too high of a standard. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think that it makes sense to say that we know something without justification. Um, it's not good enough that we just happen to have a true belief. You also yeah. need to have some good reason, some what I'd call an objectively good reason, not just a reason yeah. I like. Um, for instance, one of my favorite examples is those mat those magic eight balls, you know, those little mm -hmm. gag gifts you can get. Yeah. And you can take the magic eight ball and you can ask it a question like, um, you know, should I, um, you know, should I go to the movies today? And you shake it and you turn it over and it says all signs point to yes, I guess I should go. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, <laughs> could you imagine if you're trying to make an important decision like, uh, you know, should I take all of my money out of my retirement account and, you know, put it on this penny stock, you know, in a day trading, uh, you know, scheme, you know, shake it. And it, if it says all signs point to yes, does that give yeah. me an objectively good reason to do that? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I, I think that we could all pretty clearly say, no, that's not right. an objectively good reason to think so. Um, so um, knowledge seems to require those three things. Um, there's a little bit of a, of a history lesson why some philosophers reject th this account. Um, and what's kind of come in its wake has been the attempt to, to fix it by throwing in some kind of new fourth condition or other analysis, um, which, no surprise, have not really been all that successful. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I can keep going down that rabbit hole um, if you want, <laughs> but I'm also fine to leave it at that. But I yeah, yeah it's well, justified true belief. Right. I like to say this. If, if um, tell me what you think. If somebody says, no, there's more needed, I say, okay, well, maybe there is, but can we at least agree that for you to have knowledge of something, you at least have to have justified true belief, maybe something more? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, and it, I think that is a good way to, to approach it. And, and that gives at least what I would say is common ground for all of us to talk about. And a lot of times these fourth conditions, um, are once again it's hard to even some of them don't you you wouldn't even recognize what you know they're very uh they're, they've been engineered to just deal with one kind of problem mm -hmm. so generally speaking it's the justified true belief that we all agree yeah. on so this is all going to set up uh really uh, what we're going to talk about today and we're going to talk about justification and defeaters quite a bit and so just to set this up a little bit more, like I said earlier, I've been looking up to you, learning from you for the past uh, few years. In fact, you you wrote, you co-authored a, a book with Tyler McNabb, um, maybe some others. Uh, God, what was it? Something on epistemology. I can't yeah. think of it off the top of my head. Debating Christian religious epistemology. There you go. There you go. Um, and, uh, you know, read the whole thing, loved it, but I'll never forget just this one term that you used. Uh, you, you wrote uh, something about it being a passive cog. Mm -hmm. And that just hit me so much. And I took it and I've used it ever since and yeah. uh, made many people mad. Good, good. <laughs> I, I, I just, definitely, when I was writing, it was was feeling the, the same kind of force of where, uh, you know, where, what I think we're going to be talking about later today, yeah. which is that, you know, there's an attempt. There's one approach to, in fact, historically, this has been called a naturalized approach to epistemology. Mm -hmm. It's this attempt to almost look at the human person as just like um, a machine or a human person, just as if it's like this, you know, this thing in nature that, that doesn't do anything, it's acted upon and react. Mm -hmm. and that's all yeah. it does. And so part of what I was even getting at in, in that little, little line I had in there where I was criticizing somebody's view who I thought has that kind of approach mm -hmm. is that it, it really doesn't look at the, the fact that uh, we really are agents of knowledge. Yeah. We are rational beings. And that there's a kind of active element behind that 
that I think is missed a lot of times. Oh, so, amen to that. The difference so yeah, between so there's an act, there's an agency to yeah. to our activity in being reasoners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like that. The difference between being active and and passive, and we are going to get into that. And and so much of that um, has been driving me over the years. You know, you were you know when the the free thinking argument when I was first developing that when when that was still in its infancy. Um, you know, I realized that this is a metaphysical argument that's inextricably linked with epistemology, um, which makes it a pretty powerful argument if it passes. And I, I thought, OK, you're a guy that focuses on metaphysics as an epistemologist. And so you you were one of the first guys that um, I contacted uh, you and your colleague, uh, Tim McGrew. Mm -hmm. And you both really encouraged me, um, told me that you thought the free thinking argument was sound and encouraged me to keep moving forward with it. So I have been moving forward with it. And, uh, uh, you know, and that's led to a, a project that you and I are, are working on uh, together now. But before I get to your version of uh, the free thinking argument, which I really love your version, maybe you want to call it the uh, I'm going to call it a version of the free thinking argument, because I think it's. Uh, it might be the best one I've seen yet. <laughs> and I've been working on it for a long time. So, uh, but before I get to yours, I want to run uh, some uh, by you, or at least a couple of the newer versions by you. I, I just had a debate with uh, Dr. Alex Malpass. He's a well-known atheist philosopher out of England. Great guy, really respect him. And he's written against the free thinking argument on his blog in the past. And uh, one thing's led to another, and I had a, a nice uh, debate with him on the uh, unbelievable YouTube channel uh, not too long ago. Okay. went really well, I thought. But here's the version that I offered him. And tell me what you think of this. I, I said, premise one, um, if naturalistic determinism is true, then human beings lack libertarian freedom. We both agreed that's true by definition, so we went on to the next one. I said, if human beings lack libertarian freedom, then their rational processes are unreliable to attain truth about metaphysical matters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to defend that, I would say that's because they'd be determined by mindless antecedent conditions that know nothing about metaphysics and don't care if humans do either. There's not like there's some evolutionary advantage to believing in the existence of abstract objects or not. Yeah. Um, and then three... Uh, last premise, I said, human beings' rational processes are reliable to attain truth about metaphysical matters. And that's, you know, I kind of defended it like, you know, just saying that to be involved in this conversation about is about metaphysical matters. And it seems to assume the truth of this premise and to rationally argue against it assumes it too. Yeah. Um, that seems to be a great reason to think this premise is <laughs> likely true. <laughs> so do you think those premises yeah. are all true? Yeah, I would agree with all that. Yeah, I think Great. that's right. So then we get two conclusions. Therefore, human beings have libertarian freedom and therefore naturalistic determinism is false. So, yeah, you don't see any question begging going on Not there? No. Okay. Great. Great. I, you know, it, it, it often gets accused of of question begging or uh that is invalid or not sound in some way, but man, I you know, I I think yeah. it is. I'm glad to know you you're giving it a stamp of approval. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Um, here's after that debate, I uh, offered another one similar to that because he was a little concerned about some of the wording I'd, I'd used. Um, so to clarify it, I added one more premise and it went like this. So premise one, if naturalistic determinism is true, then mindless stuff determines all metaphysicians to affirm false metaphysical beliefs. And, you know, I backed that up by saying even Graham Oppie has said that there's, you know, if there's one thing true about metaphys metaphysicians. There's no uh, majority agreement on hardly anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so nobody's going to claim to be the infallible metaphysician. Um, number two, if mindless stuff determines all metaphysicians to affirm false metaphysical beliefs, then metaphysical beliefs, including those which happen to be true by accident, are not justified. Would you say that's true? The second premise, I'm still thinking a little bit on the first one, but I, uh, the way you've worded the second one, uh, I don't think would be problematic. Okay. Do you want me to go back to the first one? Yeah. My my one concern is that you said that it would determine them to have false beliefs. Why not just say um, 
that 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 there would be no reason to think that it, that there would be that they would likely be true beliefs. Like maybe they could get some true beliefs. It'd just be by accident, right? Oh yeah, I think so. I think they. I think that I'm not saying that metaphysicians don't have any true beliefs, but I'm saying uh, mindless stuff determines all metaphysicians uh, oh, to oh. at least get one thing wrong about metaphysics. Got it. Okay. Good. You think then that's probably true? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Cool. But I. I can see rewording it that way. What you just mentioned, that might be a better way, but yeah, let me keep rolling through here. Oh, yeah. Um, you like two. So number three would be if metaphysical beliefs are not justified, then metaphysicians do not possess knowledge of metaphysics. That seems yep. absurd yep. <laughs> to, to that, disagree with. Yep. And once um, again, that's that same, what we started with, right? That if yeah. justification is a condition for knowledge, if you say they lack the justification, they're going to lack the knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So then the fourth premise is, well, metaphysicians do possess knowledge of metaphysics. Yeah. And uh, what metaphysician is going to uh, reject that one? <laughs> I don't think they're going to. And then we've got, therefore, mindless stuff yeah. does not determine all met metaphysicians to affirm false metaphysical yeah. beliefs. And then, therefore, naturalistic determinism is false. So, yeah, yeah, you know, these, that's, that. the, that's the gist. Uh, there's a bunch of different wordings that I've offered out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and often what I find is detractors most of the time don't want to deal with the big ideas that are driving each premise, but they want to nitpick on words. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, fine. I can reword this for you. Yeah. And until the big ideas are, are dealt with, I think these kind of arguments are going to remain. Um, is, what do you think? Your, your strategy and, and the way you formulated both of those intentionally trying to focus on these metaphysical beliefs because, you know, just to avoid the argument of, well, maybe naturalism could have given us, could have conditioned us to reliably get true beliefs about the natural world or the physical world. So, okay, let's just set that whole issue aside and let's just talk exclusively about metaphysics where there would seem to be no possible way for a naturalistic evolutionary explanation of how we could have cognitive faculties oriented to know those kinds of truths. Yeah, that's exactly right. I wanted to bracket that. Um, let's discuss, because what are we doing right now? We're talking about metaphysics. What makes it possible to do what we're doing right yeah. here? I, I uh, It is interesting to see if it applies to other things, but for the sake of argument, I'm willing to grant that perhaps naturalistic determinism could maybe give us knowledge on how to cross the street or how to avoid tigers, you know, things like right. that. I'm willing to grant that, like you said, set it aside. Let's focus on what we're doing right now. Yeah. So very good. Well, cool. Well, let's, let's move on. Um, so yeah, you were a, a contributor to that book that I mentioned earlier, and I've gotten a lot of mileage uh, over the, those two simple words, passive cog. And <laughs> just reading that just really helped form even more of my, uh, ideas as I was moving forward. Um, so anyway, as, as you and I have continued to discuss these things a little bit here and there, uh, I recently invited you to flesh out your thoughts on these matters in a chapter that will be published in a forthcoming book uh, that's focused on arguments from reason and libertarian freedom. And you read a portion of your soon to be released essay at the EPS in San Antonio a couple months ago. And you're a uh, paper was entitled Why Rationality Requires Libertarian Freedom. Now, John, this might surprise you, but there are many folks out there who haven't connected those dots yet and yeah. do not, uh, they don't see why this is the case. Uh, and in fact, there's many folks out there who are passionately opposed <laughs> to uh, the title of your paper. Yeah. So hopefully you can enlighten them today. So are you ready to shed some light on uh, what it takes to be a, a rational agent who can gain at least some important kinds of knowledge. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I definitely appreciate that we are get wading into some deep and heavy matters. And I think and I've had, a, of course, this is an issue that I've also wrestled with others with. I, I understand there's also some theological things in the background for some folks that have a hard time, in particular with libertarian freedom. Yeah. Um, but that's that's for you to, to, to correct. Um, I'll shed as much light as I, as I can, but I also recognize, man, this is some, we're, we're doing some hard stuff right now. So, yeah. And this is, uh, it's surprising to me that this topic can become so emotional for so many people. Yeah. And, and I realize that now. So 
it, it is good to uh, to be careful and just to you know say up front, we we aren't trying to step on your toes or anybody's toes here. We're not trying to hurt feelings. We're trying to get to truth, um, a truth about ultimate reality. And we do think that this is actually uh, what what we've discovered here is that we've got evidence that points toward uh, God. And I think the best explanation of that is the biblical view of ultimate reality. But, uh, but yeah, this can be emotional for folks because it does jar, uh, jar them because they, many people are kind of deeply con they're, they're attached, emotionally attached to some deterministic views. And, uh, you know, I just want to, I, I used to be there. I used to be a determinist and I fought this for so long when I finally, finally let go of my determinism. And I felt this weight come off of me. It's like I saw the world and new color. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I, I felt like it's improved my walk with, uh, with God as well. But anyway, this is related and uh, we're going to try to be careful as we move forward. Yeah. So, all right. Well, um, I love one thing I loved about your essay. I've read it probably three or four times now. And then I, I heard you uh, give a, a speech on it at EPS. But one thing that I love about your essay is that you make a distinction between moral responsibility and rational responsibility. And so many people, I think, miss the boat, miss the target. They miss something. Uh, they get bogged down with the idea that moral responsibility might be or could be comp uh, compatible with determinism. When really, I think there's that's an important question. But there's something much more important to discuss, something deeper, and that's rational responsibility. After all, I don't know if we even hold non-rational uh, beings morally responsible. I don't think we do because we've got the age of accountability um, yeah. that we understand. You know, we, we don't hold uh, toddlers uh, morally responsible for things. Um, we, we shouldn't. And anyway, um, it's because I don't think they're, they're not yet rationally responsible. But before we get into rational responsibility, I do want to quickly touch on what you said kind of in passing in your paper about moral responsibility. So if you don't mind, I'm going to quote you. I'm going to read from your paper and then I'll let you talk about it a little bit. Is that cool? Sounds great. All right. So you said, suppose someone offers me a shot of heroin. Now you talked about LSD a little earlier, so I'm a little worried about you right now, John. <laughs> but all right. Sorry about that. All right. You said, suppose someone offers me a shot of heroin, which I immediately decline. Whew, because the act is so contrary to my formed character. While I may no longer be metaphysically free with respect to choosing the heroine, I remain morally responsible with respect to the choice because my character has been formed by my prior free choices. Similarly, a heroin addict may be in such a state that he may not have the ability to decline the heroin if it's offered to him, Despite his present lack of metaphysical freedom in this matter, he remains morally responsible for the choice if he has put himself in this state as a result of his past free choices. This type of libertarian free will acknowledges that a central component of moral responsibility has its origin in the free choices of the agent, but it does not thereby entail that all morally responsible choices must be free actions. End quote. So, Comment on that for us, if you would, John. Yeah, I think one of the common objections to libertarian free will, um, or is that one the idea that that libertarian freedom people sometimes think just is moral responsibility, or they think that's what the libertarian is claiming is that you're only morally responsible when you have libertarian free will, because that's usually one of the core arguments is this idea that. Why believe in libertarian free will? Because you need it for moral responsibility. Um, and then people will say, well, what about these cases where you're not, uh, where you don't have libertarian freedom, but we still think you have moral responsibility? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that doesn't mean that libertarian freedom factors into that for nothing. It's just that you come back and you say, what determined that action? If you're a drug addict and you have put yourself in a, in a state where you are severely addicted to drugs, maybe so much so 
that you no longer have freedom to uh, deny drugs when offered to you. Um, we would say that you still have moral responsibility. You are determined mm -hmm. in that event, but what determined it precedes all these actions before it, where you, at some point you did have the freedom to choose or to, to choose the drugs or to reject them. Yeah. You know, to, to, to pick a slightly different example, you know, that somebody who is a driving while drunk, um, mm -hmm. they might, uh, you know, hit another car, kill somebody. Um, and if their defense was, well, I was drunk, I couldn't help it. I couldn't do anything otherwise than what I did. We don't let them off the hook, morally speaking. We back it up and say, but you made the choice to get drunk and then you made the choice to drive. Yeah. Um, at some point, you had the freedom to refrain from, from making a choice that put you ultimately there. And since there were free choices that led to this event, we're going to hold you morally responsible to, for that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's funny that you mentioned that uh, and related to a sad story. Just this morning, I uh, was scrolling through uh, the headlines on social media and I saw that <clears throat> this uh, woman, I think in California, which would make sense, but uh, she took a couple bong hits, said she lost control and stabbed her boyfriend 108 times, killing him. Oh, wow. She was let off. Because the judge said she didn't have free will at that wow. time. But what she what the judge missed was, well, she chose to take the bong hits that were laced with whatever in the first place. And so, yeah, I disagree with the judge. I talked to my wife about it this morning. I was like, no, she is she is morally responsible for killing her boyfriend um, because she shouldn't have been doing drugs. <laughs> so, she, yeah. yeah, there's a classic. Uh court case with uh, the great, um, very famous lawyer, Clarence Darrow, where uh, the start of the 20th century, where he tried to get some boys off um, who had murdered their parents yeah. on the grounds that they were, you know, they were causally determined and it was all mm -hmm. determined, so you couldn't hold them responsible. Yeah. Um, I believe he lost the case, if I remember. Yeah, right. I think so. Yeah. But yeah. Well, if naturalistic, no if naturalistic determinism is true, that could be the uh, the plea at every court case. Right. So that, you know, in one sense, and Darrow uh, um, was an atheist and, and all of that. I mean, like he may have just been working out the worldview of what would happen mm -hmm. if that was, in fact, the case. If if uh, naturalistic determinism is true, um, then in a sense, you know, we're all like the, these boys who, you know, he was pointing to how they were abused and their parents, you know, did all these terrible things to them. And, and raised them poorly and with and all these things so you know they couldn't have done otherwise yeah. well in a sense if uh, a naturalistic worldview is correct that's that's true of all of us mm -hmm. and and one of the flips on this is not only is it about moral responsibility for the bad but there's also moral praiseworthiness that also goes away without this yeah. that um we look at moral evaluation both negative and positive we tend to focus a lot on punishments and, and the way in which you are morally responsible for the bad things you do, but you're also morally responsible in a good way for the good things you do. Yeah. Um, and we give moral credit and praise to individuals because we believe they exercise their free will mm -hmm. in a way to do good things when they could have exercised it to do bad things. Yeah. So um, you don't just lose the blame for the bad, but you also lose the praise for the good. Hmm. Yeah. Well said. Okay, so let's talk about um, something you mentioned, like at a certain moment, uh, you, it's, uh, you're determined, say, by your, your character to say no to the heroin or say no to the drugs when it's offered to you. But that's because along the way, you've made uh, a bunch of libertarian free will choices that have formed your character in such a way that you are now um, determined to say no to the drugs. So would we call these self-forming actions? Yeah, that's right. We And that's following a philosopher named Robert Kane at the University of Texas, who writes a lot about this. Um, and he's really just stealing it from Aristotle. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think this can apply to love as well. I, I don't believe in love at first sight, but uh, with my wife, I, I believe that she and I both really chose chose to put herself in situations where we would, I think, rather quickly uh, grow in love with each other. And, you know, I, I've had one uh, philosopher 
um, one time t- tell me that you do you never choose whether to love somebody. You just find yourself loving them. And I said, well, let me think. My son, he's my stepson. He was two years old when I first met him. And he scared me to death. Did I love him? Did I just find myself loving him? No. But I put myself in a position where I grew to love him more than I I didn't think it was possible. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I do. I think I, there was self-forming actions along the way that that lead to love, that lead to us saying no to drugs, um, and you know whatever the case might be. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And and I think that this is part of a. I mean, in the Christian life in particular, uh, I think that we're actually called to cultivate a life to to build within ourselves. Uh, a love for the things of God, a desire to for his law. When you read through like Psalm 119, man, there's so much of that that's like how much I love the law of the Lord. Mm. And it's like, you know, sometimes when I when I read that, I think I don't love the law of the Lord like I see in here. Mm. And so what I I take that to mean is I need to, you know, invest more into developing and cultivating these affections, um, you know, just a, a shout out to to one of our our reformed friends, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's one thing that he definitely gets right is this idea that it, part of a, a life of sanctification is making. I would put it in terms of saying we are making the choice every day um, with the Lord's help. Uh, we are choosing. Uh, we're making choices that form us more and more to have a holy character yeah. and to have the affections for. Uh, the spiritual disciplines of prayer and Bible study and worship. And that um, as a new Christian, if you're, you encounter these things and you hear people talking about how much they just love these things and you're like, I don't love these things. They're kind of boring or Mm -hmm. I don't find them at all interesting. The answer isn't like to say, well, I tried it. I guess it doesn't work. It's to say, I need to work on that. And over time through my continuing to choose these things to learn, to love them, it, a, a very common way uh, that we talk about this is like an acquired taste that, mm, yeah. um, you know, it's similar. It's not the exact same thing, but an acquired taste, you know, there you can acquire poor taste and you can, can acquire good taste. I knew a guy who worked a night shift as a security guard. And the only coffee that they had was this like terrible coffee that came out of a you know vending machine. And this was years ago. I think even what yeah. you can get today is way better. And, mm-hmm. At first, he hated the coffee. It tasted terrible. But over time, he came to grow to like this terrible coffee because, mm-hmm. you know, he had some every night to keep him mm-hmm. awake. Um, and in the same way, there are some people that if you set before them a gourmet meal that has been prepared by a world class chef, they'll kind of say, yuck, I don't want it. That looks gross. I don't want that um, because their their tastes have not been cultivated mm-hmm. to enjoy those, those things. And with uh, time, you can c- come to acquire a finer taste as yeah. well. So mm. um, it's not, once again, those are not exactly the same thing, but it's a good um, analogy for what I think goes on in our character that we right. can cultivate a certain kind of character through the choices that we make. Mm-hmm. I mean, Aristotle seems to go so far as to at least say at times in the Nicomachean ethics that you just are, um, your character just is the sum of your choices. Mm. Wow. You know, uh, uh, the psychologist, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz, uh, came out with a book called You Are Not Your Brain. Mm -hmm. And really, uh, he's providing some scientific support for what you're talking about, that you can make some really hard choices that seem to go against your your flesh and even what your brain is telling you to do. You can say, stop it, brain. You're lying to me again. I think Paul would say that's taking your thoughts captive. Yeah. And then say, no, I am going to, no matter how hard it is, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to think rightly here. And when you do that, he talks about how n- new neural pathways begin developing in your brain. And it's like going to the gym. You, if you go to the gym one time, do some bicep curls, it's not going to make a difference. But if you go for six weeks, you know, going five days a week, you're going to feel a difference and you're going to start to see a difference. If you go for six months, you're going to everybody's going to be saying, dude, what are you doing? You're looking great. And if you, after six years, you're going to be radically transformed. Well, if you take your thoughts captive enough, uh, let's say somebody is addicted to pornography and they, they come to realize now this is wrong. This is bad. It's evil. I've got to change, but they wake up in the morning and their brain is screaming at them to go look at it. But they're, but they know they're like, no, 
I know Christianity is true. I'm going to say no to this. So I'm not going to do it. And as soon as they do that once, boom, a new neural pathway starts mm -hmm. to begin forming. And if they, they might fall off the horse here and there, but if they try to make it a habit and do this repeatedly and have more victories than losses, then pretty soon over the course of a few weeks, it's going to get a lot easier to avoid the pornography or to avoid the the uh, the heroin that you were talking about <laughs> over over uh, months it's going to get different over, over years your brain he talks about will be radically transformed and so you when you wake up in the morning it won't be screaming at you to go mm -hmm. look at that stuff uh, it might be screaming at you to get into the Bible you know <laughs> so yeah. uh, have you studied uh, self directed neuroplasticity at all oh yeah yeah definitely like this is. Part of the things that interest that's related to the things that interest me in the metaphysics of free will, of course, but also um, in my current position, I'm an educator. Um, I oversee a school. Uh, this is a really important part of the way we think about education. Um, you know, there's a whole literature that's adjacent to this uh, called the growth mindset. Um, you know, very popular level book by psychologist Carol Dweck on this, um, and it's used by educators, coaches business people, churches, like the idea is very much along these lines that you can either have a fixed mindset where you say, I'm just born this way. Um, I can't change things. If things don't come to me easily, I don't want to do them. Or you can have a growth mindset, which is to say, with hard work and effort, with changes, I'm able to transform the way in which I think and do things. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, that, that that is a very important truth because uh, the growth mindset, it's not just like self-help therapy. This isn't just right. name it and claim it stuff. It's grounded in neuroscience. It's grounded yeah. in an understanding that we are not fixed in the ways in which we think. And it gives mm -hmm. me actually quite a bit of hope when we, the more we get into the science of free will and rationality to realize that we are not destined by our past, yeah. that the past is not going to determine our future, that there still is the freedom to change. That's right. That's um, right. I think that there's a lot of, uh, there was a lot of pessimism on this front, you know, starting with, you know, Isaac Newton, um, you know, thinking that all of science was going to give us this very detailed deterministic uh, view of the human person. And then we started encountering uh, science in the 20th century in particular that was not fitting in that mold. And it really threw a curveball for determinists. And there are philosophers who reject determinism today for completely, you know, who, as far as I know, are not theists in any way. And they reject it because they just say it's incompatible with science, that <laughs> science just can't support the thesis of uh, determinism. Mm -hmm. And that's why they would give it up. So, yeah. um, you know, that's definitely been a, a development that I think people couldn't have seen in the 1800s of where this argument would end up going. Right. Right. Well, uh, w one last thought. Um, I, I look at SFAs or self-forming actions. Uh, I see those, how those are related to moral agency as uh, indirect doxastic voluntarism is related to rational yeah. agency. Uh, would you uh, talk about what indirect doxastic voluntarism is and then tell me what you think about that? Is it, a, is it right to compare those two kinds of things? Yeah. So doxastic voluntarism is this idea that you can will to choose what you believe. Um, so the direct version of that would simply be that you could just immediately choose um, to believe one thing or another thing. Um, there are a lot of beliefs that seem very hard, like maybe even impossible to do that. So for instance, um, right now, if you were to offer me you know, a, a large sum of money, you know, $50,000, if I would just choose to believe that um, I'm not sitting in front of a computer right now. I mean, I could probably tell you with a wink that uh, I'm not sitting in yeah. front of a computer right now, or I don't believe it. But the truth is, um, I can't help believing right now that I'm sitting in front of a computer. There just seem to be certain immediate and pressing beliefs that uh, are beyond our control. Um, However, um, the question is, is that the case with everything we believe? And I would say uh, the answer seems to be no. And so um, there, there's an, a model for this that also follows agency and, and choice. 
So um, going back to our, our, the behavior of our addicts, you know, somebody might recognize, man, I need to stop doing heroin. It is destroying my life and my family. Uh, but they also recognize I can't just, I, I'm, I'm too weak. If mm -hmm. somebody puts it in front of me, I don't have the willpower yeah. to say no. It is fixed for me right now. So what they can do, though, is that they recognize that they want to quit, but they recognize their addiction makes it so they can't say no when offered. They need to make choices to keep them away from anybody who will offer them those kinds of drugs. Uh, or to pick a different, the example you used with the person who's addicted to pornography. Um, if you realize that you want to quit viewing pornography, but you are not able, you don't have the willpower to say no to that choice in the morning um, or whatever those weak points are in your right. life, then what you need to do is put hard, when you do have the freedom, when you do recognize the need to stop that, put hard barriers around your ability to even make the yes yeah. so that you take the internet out of your house or you put mm -hmm. filters on your phone or you, um, you know, have an accountability partner who, you know, will get a, a copy of every, you know, website that you look at, those sorts of things. Yeah. And what can happen is that you make those choices to put those hard barriers so you don't even get tempted, you're not put in the temptation. But then after you make the choices over time, you can take those barriers away and now you do have the the willpower, the freedom to mm -hmm. say no. You know, the temptation is not so strong that you can't turn it down. So, yeah. Um, yeah. John, what I love about this is not only is, is this fun academic exercises that scholars can think about, but it really has real world implications at a practical yeah. level. You know, we take it down from the ivory towers and take it to the streets and see it transform yeah. lives when, when people get this. So um, I, I think it's, it's not just fun, but it's important, <laughs> you know, and, so. If I can say one more example that's with belief real fast mm -hmm. on this is to, yeah. to just circle around to say, suppose somebody comes to intellectually assent to the idea that Christianity is true, but it doesn't really translate into genuine belief. Like they can see the premises of the mm -hmm. argument are true, that they logically imply the conclusion, but they just can't bring themselves to actually believe um, the tenets of Christianity, to start going to church, to worship a God, to open their Bible and pray. Um, and they recognize maybe that this is, this needs to be remedied. Like if God really does exist, I, you know, he, I owe him my allegiance that mm -hmm. I ought to, you know, believe in this way that I'm not doing right now. Yeah. What I would say um, is that you, you can't just turn it on. It's not, maybe there's, this is not doc doxastic voluntaristic in the sense of direct control of just flipping right. on the switch. And now, going to church and believing like every, all the, the other uh, Christians around you. Mm -hmm. but what you can do is you can direct something, you can have some indirect control. So, you know, what keeps you from actually fully accepting this belief that you intellectually recognize as true? Well, maybe it's because you are hanging out with a lot of people who have contempt for Christianity yeah. and for God. So, you know, what you might want to do, you might want to stop hanging out with those people, at least for this period of time. Uh, because that's what's keeping that might be one thing that's keeping you, you know, if yeah. you are surrounding yourself with a bunch of, you know, you enjoy reading a lot of of writers uh, or movies and TV shows that make light of belief in God. And, you know, Christianity is always the butt of their jokes. Yeah, then you need to, to cut those things at least out of your life for a period of time while you are uh, wanting to to change your beliefs here and maybe surround yourself with people who you really like, people you look up to who do believe in God, read books and movies and TV shows that have to do with uh, Christian themes and with uh, Christian exemplars. You know, for me, that's like C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton mm -hmm. and J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, that uh, I that these would be encouraging figures that inspire you to say, I want to believe like them. Yeah. And then you can find yourself over time shifting such that you can now connect the intellectual assent to what you genuinely believe. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, but you just had to make once again, some of these other changes to indirectly make that possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you know, maybe a, a, a real world example of this. What is her name? She was known as the fifth yeah. horseman. I uh, know who you're talking about. I don't remember her name either. <laughs> her, 
uh, Bayana Percy Ali or something like that. Something yes. like that. I probably butchered her name. But uh, I mean, she was very influential in advancing atheism over the, the past couple decades. And I think she kind of started to realize that atheism and Islam, all these other worldviews can't answer the big questions and the big problems in the world, but that Christianity can, the law of Christ can. And I don't, you know, there's a lot of debate out there if, if she really believes Christianity is true right now. But I think it's safe to say that she thinks it's at least the best explanation, even if it's the best of a, a bad lot. I don't know. I don't know if that's her position or not. But but I think she's thinking, OK, I'm going to live as if it's true. I don't want to put these words in her mouth, but perhaps it's I'm going to live as if it's true. And if she does that, it seems to me like she might be growing more in her justification for her for this belief. And maybe we'll, we'll see that go above the 50 percent. Is that the is that the threshold? Do you think that it would need to? <laughs> how do you think that works out as an epistemologist? Yeah. You know, I've I've wondered about this myself. I mean, it's hard drawing the line on some of these things is so hard, uh, you know, but I have uh, I think that what I've settled on and, and something that I'm open to revision on, this is not the hill I want to die on. But I do yeah. think uh, the idea is something like I'd say it's great. It has to be more probable. I have to believe it with credence higher than its negation. You know, so that would put it 51. <laughs> OK. Yeah, 51%. <laughs> I'm friends with an evolutionary biologist here at the local university, and uh, she's a, a fairly new Christian. Um, and, uh, you know, she used to teach atheism in her classes, and she's come to see wow. that Christianity is true. But she, she tells me to this day, Tim, I believe Christianity is true with 51% certainty, and that's enough for me to put my faith in it. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. 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 And I would say it's probably grown since then. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So yeah, my point was, so indirect doxastic volunteerism is, is making choices along the way. Um, may, maybe bracketing your biases, being aware of your emotional attachments to certain views and maybe I should, maybe I should try to bracket that. Maybe I should be more willing to consider this argument. Um, making choices along the way to where uh, that, that ultimately leads to your beliefs. I can't. Uh, I'm, I'm in not. A, I'm in no position right now to think that Christianity is false. I can't do it. <laughs> right? I sincerely believe it's true. So if somebody says, "Hey, I'll, I'll if for even for for one minute, if you can really believe that Christianity is false for one minute, I'll give you a billion dollars." Well, not only do I not want to, I, I can't. Right. I mean, even if I wanted to. Uh, maybe some of those less uh, less important. Um, if, uh, yeah, the existence of Bigfoot. Yeah, the existence of Bigfoot. Or, or, I don't know if you're Bigfoot. if you're a Bigfoot believer, but uh, you know if you're not a believer, <laughs> right, uh, right. Or if there's an elephant in the room with me right now, you know, uh, I I can't do that. But if you said, Tim, there is an elephant in the room, are you willing to at least consider my argument? And now maybe there is an elephant in the room, but if I'm like, I'm not going to listen to you. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, then I would, then it seems like I'm responsible for not considering your argument. And then if I get trampled by the elephant, well, that's, that's yeah. on me. I didn't consider your argument. Uh, is that a decent way to describe sure. indirect doxastic voluntarism or what yeah. would you add to it? You know, one of the, I think some helpful terminology uh, can come from uh, William James, and he has this essay, um, "The Will to Believe," hmm. and and it's kind of a an essay on um, it's like a pragmatic argument to believe in God, kind of like Pascal's wager. Um, we can set all the argument aside, but one of the things he talks about is that you need, in order for you to choose to believe something, it needs to be considered what he calls a live option. Hmm. So. There are some things that are dead options to us, like, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, you're a talking fish or something like that. Yeah. But um, there might be things that I'm uh, that I tend not to believe. But you could tell me, you know, that you have reasons for that. If I would listen to them, that could be live options. Like if um, you were to tell me that you're actually 55 years old. I would say, no way, you know, you're, you're way younger than that. You're like, no, 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 I just look young. You know, I, I take good care of myself. Um, you know, I've got a birth certificate yeah. here. You want to see, you know, like, I guess it, 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 that's a live option, although something I, I don't believe, you know, it's something that I think is 
not very likely to be true. Well, so, I am 50. Yeah. I doubt that. You're not. I, it's true. No. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I would, I would, I would have pegged you to be like 10 years younger than me, to be honest. <laughs> I wish my knees uh, will tell you that I'm 50 years old, but no, well, everything you said though is true. Like I can say, no, I, I've, I've eaten well uh, since, you know, when I was 18, I got into fitness. I've eaten well since then. I've worked out every day, uh, almost every day. And I've just tried to take care of myself. And yeah. plus I shave my head so you can't see how far back my receding hairline is. So I do look a lot younger than 50, but I promise you I am 50 years old. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, congratulations on taking care of yourself. See, you yeah. you, <laughs> Thank got, you you almost proved me totally wrong. I'm glad I picked <laughs> a higher number. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now anything else you'd like to add on indirect doxastic voluntarism before we get to your argument? No, I, I, I think that, it, I think that gets the idea just once again, that you can, um, you know, we can, we know that, that there are things that we might even want to believe. Let me give one, maybe I'll say one more thing, which is that yeah, go ahead, please consider like more of a personal example. Like there's somebody at your work or somebody in your life that you want to believe there's that they have like some kind of good or noble cause. Like maybe they're constantly doing things that make your life difficult. And one interpretation of that um, could just be, you know, maybe you, you, what you've always thought is this person is just a total jerk and they're out to get me. But then one day, like their friend or, a co or you know, a, a common friend between the two of you says, you know, I know you think this about so and so, but they actually mean good. Hmm. And you might not be able to turn once again to believe that. But maybe you get to this place where you say, you know, maybe I have been judgment. I want to put myself into a position where I could see a different side of this person mm -hmm. where I don't just always think everything they do has this negative, nasty motive behind it. Wow. And so once again, maybe it's important for us to be able to say, recognize I can't do that right now, but for me to put myself in that position, I need to start treating this person d differently and doing some different things in my own life that open me up to that possibility. Wow. Again, this is not just an academic exercise, but that has pastoral weight yeah. to it. Um, just so good to hear that. All right. Well, let's discuss what is required now to be a rational agent. Um, let me read you uh, your summary that you wrote in your paper uh, about uh, your argument from rational agency, and, uh, and then I'll let you comment. So you said, quote, the argument from rational agency roughly goes like this. Supposing that libertarian free will is false, then everything that one believes is ultimately due to the laws of nature and events in the remote past. The laws of nature and events in the remote past are beyond the control and responsibility of any individual. So no one ultimately has any control or responsibility for anything that he believes. But a necessary condition for, a, for, for rational agency is that a person is in control and responsible for his beliefs. After all, if a person's beliefs are entirely determined by factors outside of his responsible control, then everything he believes is ultimately due to the circumstances and events out of his control. Therefore, without libertarian freedom, there is no rational agency." End quote. Now, uh, John, you offer a footnote in your paper uh, noting many others who have advanced similar arguments. And thank you for the shout out. You put me and JP Moreland in there, our paper. But I really love how you phrased it here. Love it. And uh, really want to advance this. So I, I want to give the formal argument here pretty soon, but quickly talk about the big ideas that you're advancing here. You know, I try to intentionally model this off of what's generally thought to be one of the most popular, persuasive, effective arguments for libertarian freedom, which is that idea that if uh, all of our actions are de determined by causes and conditions that precede us, then on that argument, you can't be morally responsible. So this mm -hmm. idea, it's called um, the... Um, Oh, uh, Peter Van Inwagen's argument, uh, the, and now I'm dropping that name. Uh, you got the, uh, the transfer of powerlessness principle. Um, is that what it's, you're talking about? No. Um, oh, the, it's just called the consequence argument. Oh yeah. 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 Right. So the consequence argument is just this idea that in more in the moral realm, 
uh, that you, if you, if causes and conditions that precede it, uh, precede all of your actions, determine all of your actions, then you uh, have no control over what you do and therefore you can't be morally responsible for it. I've tried to mirror that in the rational realm, that if all of the causes and conditions that pre that precede us are actually what determine what we believe, then we'd get no rational credit um, for anything we do. Because all it did mm -hmm. is it just passed through us, but we didn't actually do anything. So yeah. we don't deserve, uh, we can't really call ourselves the rational agents of those things. Right. Uh, it, we were just the, the machinery, the hardware it ran through. Um, mm -hmm. And so the rightful place to give credit would be where the original causes and conditions come from and not to put it in, into us. So um, that was the idea is to say that uh, if we don't have any original causal contribution to what we believe in any way, then we don't deserve any credit for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if I remember correctly, you do uh, cite and wagons consequence argument in your paper, don't you? That's right. In the paper, I, I intentionally kind of model it that way. There's mm -hmm. a setup where I give Van Inwagen kind of even summarize his argument in a very quick way first and then go into this one second. Yep. Yep. All right. So then uh, you help us out. I love premises and deductive arguments. And so you, you list this out for us and let me read it here. You say premise one, rational agency requires that the agent is ultimately responsible for what he believes. Two, if libertarian free will does not exist, then everything that one believes is ultimately due to the laws of nature and events in the remote past. Three, no one is ultimately responsible for the laws of nature and events in the remote past. Therefore, four, if libertarian free will does not exist, then no one is ultimately responsible for anything that he believes. Therefore, five, if libertarian free will does not exist, then everything that one believes is not a product of rational agency. I mean, that's a, that's a hard hitting conclusion. <laughs> I love it. What, what do you think? Well, you know, I, I walk into this argument. I, I certainly believe it's true and, and want to defend it as I do in the paper. Um, I will say that, that this is, I don't, on the level of certainty that I put behind it, it's not, it's not a philosophical position that I think, man, is uh, at the very top of the list. Once you knock the hill that I'm going to die on, mm -hmm. um, we are in some pretty heavy grounds. But, but once again, I think the, as I look at each claim, I think that this is correct. Um, you know, that ultimate responsibility um, is required for any kind of credit, um, whether that's rational or moral. So in this case, mm -hmm. we're talking about giving a kind of rational credit, a rational uh, responsibility is tied to this ultimate agency that if uh once again all the the causes that preceded me um do all the work basically that they they essentially determine the outcome then i contributed nothing and i deserve no credit and therefore really can't be considered a rational agent in the process yeah. Yeah. um you know that if the causes were different i would have believed differently mm -hmm. if my the machinery that deterministically within me produces those beliefs was different, I'd believe differently, but I just, you know, for my choices and my agency, it is nothing. Um, so that is, is really the, the core of the idea. And the reason why I framed it this way is because over time, this is where you were talking about the self-forming actions earlier, that we can develop habits of the mind. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of what, what philosophers call the intellectual virtues. So there are moral virtues that we talk about of, mm -hmm habits and ways of being that allow us to uh, live moral lives out of almost a habituated nature, out of a predisposition, out of a disposition to do the good. Well, in the same way, we can habituate patterns of reasoning and habits of thought that make it such that we are disposed towards the true and avoiding the false. Hmm. Um, we can actually habituate those things and internalize those virtues to such a degree they almost become automatic. Yeah. Now, when you become that virtuous, perhaps it becomes, even if you will, determined by your character. Right. However, it's not, you would still be the ultimately responsible person 
for that character because you made the choices that led right. to that character. That Amen there was libertarian that. freedom at the core that mm -hmm. set you up to be yeah. that way. So, and, that, and, and you're not saying that God isn't a heavy influence in all this, and the Holy Spirit isn't. I mean, to to get us into theological territory now, we we do need the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, but. I think that we have the power to reject what he's trying to do in our lives as well. I, I think I've done it before. So. That's right. You yeah. know, there's a lot of great analogies for this. And I would even say in scripture that we have examples of this as well, um, where people, you know, Paul, um, you know, or, uh, Stephen tells the crowd that's stoning him, you know, stop resisting the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I would even look at examples that I, I think none of this is an affront to God's omnipotence and sovereignty. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I believe in a very, you know, full and robust view of God's omnipotence and sovereignty. Um, I think that, that God though um, also is a respecter of persons that he recognize our moral agency that the same way. And, and I, I get so much encouragement through being a parent. I learn through analogy, certain things that I think, uh, maybe reasons why God treats us the way that we do mm -hmm. that I can of course force my kids to do all kinds of things that I would like them to do, but that doesn't really make them good people. Yeah. What really would make them good, good, virtuous people is for them to do that on their own strength mm -hmm. by their own choices to choose it because that's what they desire and want above all else. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so once again, that's not to say that, you know, I just throw them out in the deep end and tell them to swim. Yeah. Uh, you know, I help them along the way too. Right. you know, just like God helps us. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there, it, there are, um, you know, there are these, these challenges of how you get in. And once again, it's kind of a drawing the line kind of issue. Like at what point is it God? At what point is it us? Um, those are some of always going to be hard issues. At what point does, you know, if you take a, a grain of sand and you put it on a heap, at what point does that become a hill? At what point does it become a mountain? Is, is it when you add that grain or the next one? Yeah. Those are always really hard <laughs> things to determine. Right. Um, but that doesn't stop us from seeing the clear cut cases on the, on the ends here. And, mm -hmm. and that's where we reason from is from the clear cases and knowing that however it meets in the middle, um, you know, wherever you draw that line, wherever it is, it's going to be, it's going to be logically sound. So, yeah. all right. So let, let me ask you this. I mean, are you, are you saying um, that rational agency, if your argument goes through that rational agency is not compatible with determinism? That's right. Yeah. So for somebody to respond and say, but I'm a compatibilist, how would you respond? Well, I think that compatibilism is just a warmed over version of determinism. It's kind of causal determinism with a smiley face. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that in the end, the determinist mm -hmm. picture of the universe in terms of just describing what happens and how it happens is exactly the same or compatible with the compatibilist view of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so the, my problem with the compatibilist view is that it really once against this matter of ultimate responsibility that they might say, in some sense, you voluntarily were willing to do this or you um, you you chose these things. You still have made a choice, even if it was determined by prior causes. But let's give, so to speak, credit where credit is due. If if you made the choice because of prior causes and conditions. And those prior causes and conditions ultimately came before you ever existed, then um, you don't really get any of the credit. I once again mm -hmm. wouldn't call that a rational agent. Agency yeah. implies a kind of ultimate responsibility that that the compatibilist just doesn't think that we have. Right. So, um, you know, a lot of times the difference between a compatibilist and a libertarian, we, we talk past one another because we're often using very different definitions for these mm -hmm. terms, like what it means to choose freely, for instance. Yeah. Or, yeah. And, sure. and, and once again, these are, are some really hard issues. You know, I, I, I teach these things in, in college philosophy classes all the time. Um, I, I, I can understand and, and respect to some degree the, the compatibilist view. Um, I just once again have just think it's wrong. I just don't see how you get past this issue of ultimate responsibility. 
Yeah. And it just seems uh, absurd. If, you're, if your argument shows that rational agency is not compatible with determinism, I mean, that word is, is not compatible <laughs> with determinism to then say, but I'm a compatibilist. Yeah. Like you can just say, but I showed that it's that rational agency is not compatible with determinism. And so really you have to ask them, what do you mean by compatibilism? Uh, I've written, you know, on this, something that people want to see it on, on my website and uh, on, on this YouTube channel as well. But Peter Van Inwagen was clear that people should not be talking about moral responsibility being compatible with determinism that we need to be talking about just free will in general, but that has seeped into the literature. Now, so many people have talked about moral responsibility being compatible with determinism. So typically now <clears throat> if somebody asked me to define compatibilism. I'll say it's the thesis that some kind of freedom and or moral responsibility is compatible with determinism. What the free thinking arguments do and what we're talking about specifically right here is we're showing that rational agency is not compatible with determinism. And so to say, yeah, but I think for some kind of free will and moral responsibility is compatible with determinism just misses the mark altogether. You're talking about rational agency. Yeah. And I think that if you people think about this, if you really want to embrace the deterministic view as the compatibilist at least wants to be open to, it actually changes. You know, one of the things that we tend to there are fallacies in reasoning that we like to dismiss. Like somebody says, you're only a Christian because you were raised in a Christian family. You were born in this time, mm -hmm. um, in this place. And we say, well, that's the genetic fallacy. And, you know, yeah. that doesn't follow. You know, I have these reasons for it. But actually, if you think about this, if determinism were true, that starts to get some teeth, because actually, if we just all said it's a matter of fact that causal determinism is true about human nature and about what we believe, then we would have to say everything we believe actually is kind of an accident of wow. when and where we were born. Um, and that gets us into some some really difficult things to deal with, because then you have to start asking yourself, wait a minute, even the objection. I only know this objection about the when and where I was born objection based mm -hmm. on when and where I was born. I just happened to, you know, be, you know, be born in this time in this place. So everything, even the objection starts to be undermine itself and it get, takes yeah. you down a, a, an ugly, you know, one of these terrible skeptical rabbit holes that, I, that it's hard to get out of. In fact, you may not be able to get out of it unless you jettison the original starting point. <laughs> All right. So, uh, let me read you another section of your paper. I feel weird right. reading your paper to you. Um, <laughs> but you said, of course, recognizing that everything that one believes is not a product of one's own rational agency would include one's belief that libertarian freedom is false. It would also include the belief that I don't hold any beliefs based on my rational agency. After all, once one recognizes that the vast causal chain of events that precedes someone's life causally explains what one believes, the justification of all his beliefs is called into question. Thus, the one who denies libertarian free will appears to be in the awkward position of denying his own rational agency. Uh, add some comments on what you just said there. <laughs> well, this is what's great about these uh, kind of free thinking arguments, these arguments from reason, um, you know, the, the, this whole style of argument, what makes them, I think, so compelling and interesting is that um, what they're pointing out and what I'm I'm hoping I'm pointing out here, too, is that the person who wants to reject uh, their libertarian freedom and then reject then their rational agency that that is predicated upon that, then they're in this really what I call an awkward place because they're going to have to say, well, I guess, you know, everything I believe is determined by causes and events long before I was ever brought into existence. And including, I guess, this objection, my belief that libertarian freedom is not true. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess I can't trust anything, not just, yeah. um, you know, I'm not just rejecting libertarian freedom. I'm also simultaneously kind of rejecting really everything. Um, you know, it calls into question everything, even the calling into question itself. Right. That's right. Uh, I think William Lane Craig has called this a sense of vertigo sets in once you start yeah. affirming determinism and thinking of all of its implications. Um, <clears throat> all right. There's, I had a whole bunch of objections that I wanted to throw your way, 
but I'm, uh, I think for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you a couple. Okay. So here's a couple of common ones. Somebody might say, well, causal determinism is required for rational agency. Mm -hmm. How would you respond? You know, there's a, a little bit of intu intuition that goes with this. Like, I, it's this is not entirely off base, right? Because, you know, if you look at, at certain kinds of inferences, they seem deterministic in nature, like two plus three equals five, right. that, you know, what, you want to introduce freedom into that equation? Mm -hmm. You know, like, that seems like that's only going to throw you off. Um, so, uh, but what, what's once again missing here is the idea of this ultimate responsibility that, um, we're not talking once in, this is why I, I don't think that it's a matter of exercising libertarian free will with every single rational judgment. Yeah. Hopefully we have habituated certain ways of thinking and inferences such that we no longer have to choose <laughs> to make them. Uh, that they are so deeply ingrained into our character from our previous choices that it's just a matter uh, of almost it's an automatic uh, way of thinking. Right. Yeah. So um, what I'm what I would say is that for us to preserve the agency of the rational act is for us, therefore, to to affirm that in these early stages of learning, we did have some some role in in freely affirming them in choosing to go down those paths in um, recognizing them by our own free free will. Um, so the problem with the, this objection is it almost looks at models of the way in which we are rational thinkers as mature thinkers and makes that the model for all stages. And I would say that, that, that that's one of the problems with that. Hmm. All right, John. So here's uh, another objection that might be raised. Somebody might say, well, causal determinism is consistent with rational agency. How would you respond? Yeah, so this would be a softer kind of approach. Remember, the, the earlier one is like this idea that it's required, like causal determinant is absolutely necessary yeah. for um, rational agency. So on this one, they might point to some examples, uh, you know, something that's really popular today. You know, we're, we're all wrestling with like AI. Mm -hmm. um, and so they might say, look, here's something that we could plausibly say doesn't have libertarian freedom. But it certainly seems to have, or at least to, to model rational thought. Um, mm -hmm. And if it doesn't do it now, maybe it'll do it in the next couple, you know, iterations of the technology, right? right? It, that doesn't seem, for most people on the surface, like that's that's crazy, right? So you might say, look, here's an example of something that is causally determined, but yet still exhibits rationality. Um, to pick another another example, I mean, is just once again that you can imagine people that are so well studied in a subject. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the paper I talk about a math student like this. They are so deeply knowledgeable about what they they uh, are studying in math that they can actually give the correct answer to any math uh, question given to them uh, almost immediately. Wow. And let's even just say they're just such a jazzed up student over math. If somebody asks them a math question, they can't even refrain from from uh, answering. They have to, you know, they're mm -hmm. just compelled to answer. Would we would I dare say these are like irrational entities? And so what I would want to come back to is thinking about not just the rational side, but the agent side. Yeah. So in the case of the, the AI, um, it might be able to simulate or model rationality. Mm -hmm. it, it would not itself, I think, be a rational agent um, unless it has um, what I don't think. I mean, this is a whole di different conversation for other reasons that we've talked about, but I just don't think that AI is capable of having libertarian freedom. So yeah. um, I would say um, to the extent it is, so they'd say, well, then how is it so successful? What makes mm -hmm. it look so rational? Well, it's because we've modeled it off of our own rationality, perhaps, yeah. or we have fed it enough examples of rational agency from human thinkers that it models its own inferences off of those sorts of patterns. So it gets mm -hmm. its rationality, so to speak, it borrows it from rational agents that are used as its uh, kind of the, the, the template for it. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing for math, uh, for, for this math student, I would come back to what we said about self-forming actions. Um, this math student who is so good and so accurate and so quick um, to give a response, 
um, didn't get that way on day one. This was from actually the, the consequences of uh, many, many choices they made in life to study math and pursue it and cultivate a love for mathematics. And so the fact that somebody said, but see, it is causally determined and rational. I would point to the earlier stages of that process where we would say, but it, the, the self-forming actions that led to a character of that nature were not deterministic. And so mm. that is where in the process um, it is no longer um, it is no longer deterministic. So in both cases, yeah. you have to either deny in the AI case, you either deny the rationality or you say that the libertarian freedom was actually smuggled in through uh, the models of hu human agency that yeah. it, it copies. Yeah, I like that. The smuggled in. Yeah. You know, I had a, a few months ago, I, I had a debate with uh, an AI model and, <laughs> and, and it was it was over uh, indirect doxastic volunteerism and libertarian freedom and determinism and all that. And uh, it was amazing. The uh, the computer, the AI um, right off the bat said, no, uh, if determinism is true, nobody has the power to engage in indirect doxastic voluntarism. And hmm. I was like, oh, great. So do you, uh, uh, can you do, uh, do you have this power? And it's like, no. But then it, as, as we talked, it eventually pretty much conceded that humans could have it. So there is a <laughs> big difference in the way that humans can think and be responsible for our uh, beliefs versus what AI turns out so yeah. to speak what i wouldn't call that a belief from yeah. uh, ai but uh but it was fun i i've got this on my website if people want to see that interaction and also uh i'm sure you're familiar with john searle's chinese room oh yeah uh, thought experiment which shows the different kind of uh qualitative texture i guess between what humans do yeah. when we deliberate versus yeah. uh computers um, so yeah, I don't think the, uh, the AI can, uh, really be called rational, but I like how you, I think you said how it models our, yeah, the, the rationality of its programmers, if you will. Yeah. And you know, Searle doesn't, you know, I don't agree with everything that Searle has said in philosophy for by any yeah. stretch, but when it comes to this AI issue, I think he's made some really good points. And one of these has to do with the difference between semantics and syntax. Mm -hmm. And that uh, computers operate purely off of syntactical um, operations, whereas the way we reason actually really it involves a kind of semantics, the understanding of the meanings of, yeah. of what we are thinking about and reasoning. And mm -hmm. so um, once again, I, I think that that gives us a kind of interior look into our own reasoning that makes us different than just mere machines, just yeah. um, causally determined uh, processors of, of information. Right. Yep. All right. Well, uh, let me start to wrap this up by reading uh, one more part of your essay. All right. Um, and get your comments on that. You said, and I love this part because this is, uh, I, I quote Lewis on this quite a bit and I was so happy to see that, you, that you're doing this too. I was like, yeah, we're on the, we're mm -hmm. on the same page here, but you said reasoning is not something that is done to agents, nor is it something that happens to rational agents. The act of reasoning is something that rational agents do. C.S. Lewis put it this way. It is not an object that knocks against us, nor even a sensation which we feel. Reasoning doesn't happen to us. We do it. Epistemic justification, you say, is, is more than being caused to have true beliefs or to instantiate epistemic practices that reliably produce true outputs. Epistemic justification is an activity of rational agency. The agent is an animating the act of reasoning. Thus, any causal analysis of human rationality that renders humans as completely passive actors in the reasoning process misses an important aspect of reasoning that is known firsthand to rational agents. It is this active component of rational agency that is missing from views that attempt to affirm rational agency without libertarian freedom, end quote. And amen to that. <laughs> Take it away, John. 
Well, I think that one of the, you know, one of the the reasons that I'm a libertarian is uh, from this idea that I think that I have some basis for this reflecting on my own experience. Um, you know, I'm a, an epistemologist who grounds all of our knowledge and justification in direct acquaintance. Um, now, I don't think that we have just this absolute. I understand that th th there are debates here, so I'm not throwing this down as a knockdown argument. But I do think that th there's a really good there's really good evidence of our libertarian agency that we are directly aware of in our mm -hmm. own agency. Um, if the way that I think about this is that if our lives were causally determined, if causal determinism was was completely true, then it seems like we would just sit back and we would just kind of go th go through life like a passenger in a in a car, just yeah. being taken from event to event by the causes themselves. But that's not really how we experience life. We experience life as at least in many parts. There are parts because you know, there are parts where we are passive. But there mm -hmm. are many parts where we are the active agent. We are the driver, so to speak, yeah. not the passenger. And and I think this is not just true of our actions, but also of our reasoning. Right. Um, that in reasoning, we're not always just taken passively where reason takes us. But many times we are the active thinker, the agent, the animator of thought, um, mm -hmm. the driver of the thought. Um, you know, one idea that that people sometimes forget uh, in this deterministic view of thinking is that um, even though you could give uh, certain kinds of deterministic steps in logic, there's actually in um, m there's always really an infinite number of things you can draw from a set of logical premises. There's not just one deterministic outcome. Hmm. And so there's a role for our agency to play in guiding, steering, um, driving that that reasoning from one place to another and it's just simply not in my experience at least that um my agency does nothing when it comes to my choices in action or in thought yeah i love how you talk about direct acquaintance and you know i when i was at biola my uh, professor scott smith at the time when i first started thinking about uh the ideas behind that later became the free thinking argument. He challenged me to, to really pay attention to what uh, my rational processes were. He said, I don't know if you've ever done this, but take a look inside and pay attention to what you're doing. And I started realizing, you know, there's a whole bunch of thoughts that I'm not in control of. Um, you know, a lot of times when I, I start singing a song, like, where did that come from? I haven't heard, you know, <laughs> there's so, yeah. something that fired in my brain and I heard the song in my mind and started singing it. Um, and then I couldn't get it out of my head for the next week or something, you know, but, um, and then there's, you know, just let's bring it back down to real life ministry. There's times I'm ashamed to say that a sinful thought goes through my head, just passes through. And I'm like, well, where in the world did that come from? Right. I don't know if you have that. <laughs> If you ever have that happen to you, but sometimes like what? And uh, now I've found then a difference. That's a passive thought. Now I have the active power to say, hmm, let me grab that thought and think about it for a while. Let me fantasize over that mm -hmm. evil thought. Or I can say, let me take that thought captive and destroy it um, to, to God's glory. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I experienced that qualitative text textual difference between those two kinds of things. I, I have a, a direct acquaintance between these passive thoughts. And then when I take the, the pro or the ship of reason off of autopilot and I grab the controls myself and that's so, like you said, it's, I have a direct acquaintance of it. Somebody could, I would have to have the hugest defeaters in the world. I can't even imagine the defeaters that could defeat that because of my experience of it. What do you say? Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um, let me let me let me see if I understand this just a little better. Um, you're asking what would defeat my understanding that I am the active agent behind these these thoughts and actions. Is that the, the question that I've experienced, and I experience it daily? The difference between passive thoughts and active thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, 
I think that in many ways, what the determinist puts before us is a view of the world and ourselves that is so alien to the way we actually believe it, mm -hmm. uh, or the way we actually, I mean, experience it. That the way we experience the world is not at all like the way that a determinist uh, describes it. Um, so what they're often asking us to do is to accept, you know, a certain niche, you know, set of things they got you, you know, from psychology or from the physics or some of these things and mm -hmm. say, if we extrapolated a few of these cases to everything that exists, then it would mean this about us yeah. um, and everything we think and do. But one of the reasons to reject that, I think, is to say, gosh, that is so utterly foreign to the way that I understand myself. Um, I'm going to need a lot more evidence before I, I'm going to give up what I think is a very common sense view of the self right. and it's and the way that I experience the world in favor of what what they say. And, and I'll say that I was influenced a lot in this respect by a philosopher from the mid 20th century who I hadn't learned a lot about till I started delving more in, into my own study of free will. Um, and his name is C.A. Campbell. And, uh, you know, he gave Gifford lectures. He's, he's one of these guys who was a pretty big deal in philosophy, but that seems to have been forgotten by and large. Um, but he focuses a lot on this idea that um, one of the reasons to believe in free will has to do with a reasonable assessment of what we experience as the agents who make the choices, as uh, what it's like to be the ones who, who make free choices gives us reason to believe that they exist. Yeah. Um, even go so far as to say, if we didn't have that perspective, we maybe, you know, there'd be no reason to believe in free will, but since mm -hmm. we do have the perspective, it gives us, um, almost all the reason in the world to believe in yeah. it, or yeah. at least to, to put it, to give it a, such a strong prima fascia justification that it mm -hmm. would take enormous reasons to override that. Yeah. And given the arguments that you and I and others have advanced, uh, our prima, uh, prima facie experiences and our direct acquaintance is supported by logically deductive arguments. So it's a pretty strong position, I think, yeah. to, to say, yeah, libertarian freedom exists. Absolutely. I, I, that's, that's where I land. You know, it's a hard issue. Um, I know that, that there are Christians who see this differently, that there are very good philosophers who see this differently. But I just can't bring myself to, to understand, to, to really embrace the other view that just um, all of my reason tells me that this is, uh, the best way to see it. So, yeah. Yeah. I like, I said that at the, uh, at the end of the day, um, at the very least, we can say the inference of the best explanation of all the data is we've got to have libertarian free. We cannot be determined by something or someone else entirely. We got to have right. some control. So any, any, uh, any final parting words you'd like to share, man, Thanks for, for having me on. And if anybody made it the distance on this, I appreciate you uh, hanging around and hearing what I have to say. I'm very honored that anyone would, would pay this close attention to anything I have to say. And uh, <laughs> thank you for having me on here, Tim. Uh, really appreciate it. Well, I hope to have you back on uh, soon. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, where can people go to find more of your work? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you know, I've got a website. It's a Weebly web website. So johndepoe.weebly.com or probably I've, I've probably duplicated all my academic work on um, academia.edu, which is a kind of social media site for academics. Yeah. Uh, but I've linked pretty much everything. I've got a few uh, YouTube appearances and videos that you can find on the Weebly site, all my academic papers. Um or get uh, get the book, the debating Christian uh, religious epistemology. That yeah. uh, would be the the sort of easiest thing for people to purchase or to get their hands on if they're looking for for something like that. And and my interaction with the other guys, I, I think it's a pretty. I, I'm very proud of that. But it, it's all more. That's all epistemology, not a lot of free will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as we explained, there is a connection yes. there. So that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being here, John. Uh, I'll definitely stay in touch with you. We'll have you back on at some point in the future. And uh, really looking forward to getting this project uh, published with you. And when that comes out, we'll definitely uh, have you back on. But uh, for everybody watching, I just want to encourage you, stay reasonable and keep your eyes on Christ. See you soon.